next subject for discussion is the social gospel following Christ for the loaves and fishes. Our speaker is no stranger to us, a great friend, faithful preacher of the gospel, born in Huntington, Indiana, 1946. Well, I was born the same year, just after you. Married to Sister Lillian, two children, Leslie Simmons and Jason. Jason's here with us. Jason's a great, faithful Christian and certainly supportive of the work of the Lord. He's done a considerable amount, uh, Lester has, of further education beyond the bachelor's degree. He's taught high school mathematics for about five years. Began preaching full-time back in July of 1973. Speaks for congregations as long as he could. Indiana, Missouri, <laughs> Louisiana, Ohio, Kentucky. But we've all done that, Lester, as long as we could. Texas and Colorado, North Carolina. He's written numerous uh, articles. He's been on a number of lectureships. He served as uh, editor of in Word and Doctrine. He's the founding editor and editor now of Matters of the Faith. It's been since 1994. And now he's preaching for the Piedmont Church of Christ, a relatively new work in Denver, Colorado. So they are striving hard to walk according to the straight and narrow way of the old path. And I hope anybody that plans to be in the Denver area will talk to Lester so you can find out how to find where they are and worship with him while you're there. This time, let's listen to Brother Lester bring this good lesson. Brother Lester. Yeah, 14 <laughs> It is so good to be here and to be part of this lectureship. Uh, last year, I had just begun some secular work and could not get off and be here for this week. And I missed it greatly. And I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate the good elders here. Brother David Brown is a dear friend, and I appreciate him greatly. And I appreciate also that uh, Terry Hightower, though he bid $50 on the opportunity to introduce me, did not succeed in that endeavor. I appreciated the introduction from David tonight instead of from Terry. And I'm going to stop right there because I know Terry's going to speak next, and I don't want uh, him to say too much about me then. <laughs> the Piedmont congregation has uh, been in existence for a little over a year. When we have everyone in attendance, we have 12 there. And uh, we are uh, making some progress. We are uh, uh, working hard to stand fast in the old paths and to convert as many as we possibly can with the pure gospel of Christ. And if you're ever in the area, as David suggested, please look us up and worship with us. Some of you have, and we would love to see all of you uh, in the coming months. I want to begin tonight uh, by looking together at John chapter 6. It is a familiar passage. It is the passage in which Jesus feeds about 5,000 men, not counting women and children, with five barley loaves and two fish. But I want us to notice a number of things here that occur. We want to begin in verse 2. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Now, it is the case that Jesus worked miracles, and those miracles dealt with physical needs or physical maladies that were alleviated by the miracle that Jesus performed. And because of those miracles, many came to believe in Jesus. And Jesus, it, it, it observes here that Jesus was working these miracles, and many were following because they had seen the miracles. The next thing that occurs here in John chapter 6 is that Jesus feeds this great multitude with such little food. Uh, we read of that uh, beginning in verse uh, 
eight or nine as Jesus performs this miracle. There's enough food left over from those uh, loaves and fishes that there are 12 basketfuls of fragments that remain. Now notice verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Now the main emphasis of the miracles of Jesus was not to impress people with his power, but to convince people that Jesus was who he claimed to be, the one prophesied in the page of the Old Testament, the Messiah, who would deliver his people. And apparently some had come to that conclusion that he was not just a prophet, but rather he was that prophet that had been prophesied in the Old Testament because of the miracle that he worked. Now notice verse uh, 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now this is a verse that uh, I don't know how premillennialists can overcome what occurs on this occasion. Because here's an opportunity for Jesus to become king, a physical, material king on the throne. And instead of accepting that offer, or rather being made king by force, he departs, he leaves. That's not what he came to do. Jesus' mission on earth was not to establish an earthly kingdom. If it had been, this would have been his prime opportunity to accept that opportunity. Now let's skip down to verse 26. In the intervening verses, Jesus has walked on the water of the Sea of Galilee. And in the morning, those that were on the other side where Jesus had performed this great miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 men and women and children, they had followed him over into Capernaum where he now is. And notice Jesus' discussion with them here. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. So Jesus distinguishes between those who were believing in him and following him because of the miracles that pointed to the fact that he is the Christ, and those that were merely following him because he had fed them, and they wanted continued feeding, and they wanted that food without any effort on their part or any work and labor on their part, and they realized that Jesus was capable, but he said, you're not following me for the right reason. You're following me for the loaves and the fishes. Now notice his uh, further discussion, verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So here he makes a distinction between seeking after the material, seeking after the physical, seeking after the temporal, as opposed to seeking after the spiritual and eternal. He says, what you ought to be pursuing is that which is eternal, that which is spiritual, not that which is physical and temporal. Now Jesus begins at this point to discuss some things that uh, were problematic to his hearers. He talked about him being the bread of life. In fact, he says, I am the living bread. And he talks about the fact that they needed to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. The point that Jesus makes here is a point that they refuse to accept. And they discuss this among themselves and they murmur about what Jesus is saying and they conclude that what Jesus is saying is a hard saying. Who can accept it? And so as they begin to to realize that 
Jesus is not going to just give them a free dole of food each day. That was not his mission. But rather his mission was to teach them to do the will of God just as he did. It became too difficult for them to accept. Now notice in verse 60, Many therefore of his disciples when they heard this said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? And it's interesting to notice here in this text that Jesus, even though he realizes that what he is saying has offended them, he doesn't change his message to accommodate them. He knows that what they need to hear is exactly what he's teaching them. And then beginning in verse 66, he turns to his apostles and he asks them, Will you also go away? And we remember Peter's response. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So here is, uh, in this chapter, the occasion that is referred to in the title of this lesson of following Jesus for the loaves and the fishes. I suggest to you tonight that those who accept and follow the social gospel are following Jesus for the material and the physical and the temporal rather than the spiritual. And by the way, when we talk about the social gospel, it is in its own terminology distinguished from the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul wrote, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now what Paul says there is that there is only one gospel, only one gospel accepted and given by heaven wherein we might be saved, and every other thing that pretends to be the gospel is a perversion of the gospel and will not save. And such is the case with the social gospel. The social gospel began in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. The social gospel sets forth the idea that the main purpose of the gospel is not to deliver man from sin and spiritual death, but rather to elevate man and to promote man and his social well-being here on this earth. There is an emphasis in the social gospel on the community rather than upon the individual. And oftentimes, the social gospel is proclaimed through political means. Theological liberalism and political liberalism are closely tied together. According to the social gospel, the notion of sin should not be applied to individuals, but to society as a whole. Sermons, according to them, should be designed to correct the ills of this present life with only a passing reference, if any, to life beyond the grave. Advocates of the social gospel are often uncertain about whether there is any life beyond the grave. Of necessity, such sermons are filled more with stories and references to philosophers and psychologists and current uh, personalities and books rather than to the scripture. We find in them an emphasis in the social gospel on the material, fun, food, and frolic, and the temporal is emphasized rather than the spiritual and eternal. I want to emphasize <clears throat> that the mission of Christ and the church is clearly defined in the pages of scripture. And it is not these tenets of the social gospel. Though Jesus spent time helping with the physical needs of many, as we have already noticed here in John chapter 6, and in teaching his disciples, the primary mission of Jesus' life on this earth was to bring salvation, eternal life to man. 
Before his birth, the angel of the Lord told Joseph, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1.21 He stated it this way himself in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. We're told further in John chapter 3 verse 17, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Paul observed, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That also means that those that truly follow Christ those who are faithful members of the church which Jesus purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28, have exactly the same mission that Jesus had. The mission of the church is to save the souls of men by preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Jesus ordered his followers in what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. It is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God is to be made known. Paul observed, for after the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The preaching referred to here is the message of Christ. The preaching that reflects the wisdom of God and offers salvation from sin. This is the preaching that the church is to engage in and to support. It is the case, however that the church is to be concerned about helping the temporal needs of man. The inspired Paul instructed, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to those of the household of faith. Christians are told, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. The physical needs of widows and orphans are certainly included in James' description of pure religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and our Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But notice how even benevolence has something to do with the saving of souls. Jesus stated, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Clearly, our doing good works will influence others to glorify God by the observers also submitting themselves to the Word of God. Again, the mission of the church is to save souls from the eternal wages of sin, Romans 6 and verse 23. The focus of the church of the New Testament is upon the spiritual and the eternal. Paul wrote, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 2. Jesus stated it this way. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The word things in this passage is a reference to material, physical, temporal things of life. Now let's compare and contrast the difference between the tenets of the social gospel and the gospel of Christ. The social gospel emphasizes the community, and the gospel of Christ emphasizes the individual. The social gospel 
suggest such things as it takes a village. But the gospel of Christ emphasizes the importance of the individual's role in improving his own life and reconciling himself to God. One of the results of the concept of the social gospel is that no one, according to the social gospel, is really responsible for his own behavior. His behavior is always the fault of society, of environment, the influence of others, but is not the fault of himself. The social gospel tells us that when we correct the ills of society, the individual will improve. They sneer at those who advocate personal soul salvation. They themselves consider such an approach to be an antithesis of community salvation. But contrast that with what the scriptures teach. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the gospel of Christ, there is that importance of the individual. God loved not only the world, but he loved me enough to give his son to die on the cross for my salvation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So on the final day of judgment, and there will be a day of judgment, all of us will stand before our Lord, and be held accountable for the things that we as individuals have done or not done. In Romans chapter 2, verse 6, Paul says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds? So Romans chapter 14, verse 12, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, as Peter and the eleven stand before that uh, assembled multitude on the day of Pentecost, who have been pricked in their hearts because of the preaching of the message of Jesus Christ by these men, and have cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They are told by Peter, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now listen. He goes on in verse 40, and he says, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. The implication of that is that you can be saved and have a right relationship with God even when you live in a generation of people who are totally rebellious to the teachings of the Word of God. Salvation is not obtained society-wide. Salvation is obtained in a relationship with the Lord that is individual on the basis of one's response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The solution to the problems within our society today come one by one as we convert more and more to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the solution to the ills of society. The emphasis of the gospel of Christ is on the individual. Christians are challenged to live as lights in a world that is dark. Think about that for a minute. And Paul emphasizes in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, he says that we are in the midst of a perverse and crooked nation. Uh, that was descriptive of the Roman Empire, but it's certainly descriptive of where we live today. Brethren, it's possible to live faithfully to the Lord according to the gospel of Christ in the midst of a perverse and crooked nation. And it's essential to our salvation and the salvation of others. Think for a minute 
of examples of that that we find in the pages of God's Word. Sometimes we feel like we are like Elijah all alone, and Elijah found out he wasn't all alone. But think of the circumstances of Noah. He lived in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. In fact, the world was crooked and perverse. He was the righteous one. It is possible to live righteously and faithfully to the Lord in spite of what society may do around us. Think of Daniel in Babylon. Similar circumstances. Think of the days of Paul in the first century where six out of every ten individuals in the Roman Empire were slaves. Six out of ten. And he did not suggest, nor did any of the inspired writers of the New Testament, sit-ins or protests or riots in the streets to reform society. He did it through the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of Christ, converting people like Onesimus and causing Philemon to realize that Onesimus was now a brother in Christ and that relationship in the Lord changed the circumstances of slavery and eliminated. Again, we contrast the social gospel with the gospel of Christ as we recognize the emphasis of the social gospel is upon the present, where the gospel of Christ, the emphasis is upon the eternal. The social gospel urges eradication of poverty and slums and environmental issues. The goal of the social gospel is to have heaven on earth, a utopia. It becomes more important that a man have a house on earth of good repair than to have a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens, according to the social gospel. The social gospel is involved in politics. That should be obvious at this point to achieve its goals. I met an interesting fellow a number of years ago, a member of the church, a wealthy man, who made the statement in Bible class one Sunday morning that he believed that what he paid in taxes was really giving to the Lord because the government did so many good things with it. Uh, that's apostasy gone to seed. The gospel urges the spiritual in preparation for eternity after death. Remember the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. He said, for our conversation, our citizenship, listen, brethren, our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As important as our citizenship is in the United States of America, our real citizenship is in heaven. That's where our heart is to be. That's where our desire is to be. That's where our purpose of life is to focus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, Paul says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul said, For if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's where our heart and our seeking ought to be. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Think about Abraham. His heart was in heaven. His purpose of life was to go to heaven. He didn't care where the Lord might lead him in this earth on which he lived. He wanted to go to heaven. And that's the way we ought to live as well. Jesus said on an occasion in Matthew 26, verse 11, For you have the poor always with you. We're not going to eliminate all the poor. No matter how much uh, stimulus package might be approved by our government, we're not going to eliminate all the poor. We may create some that become more and more dependent upon the government, and therefore vote in a certain way because of it. In Matthew 11 and verse 5, when Jesus told uh, 
others about to, to report to John concerning his work. He said of himself, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. But Jesus didn't heal all the blind. He didn't eliminate all the blindness. He didn't eliminate all the lameness. He didn't eliminate all the deafness. The purpose of the miracles was to point to the fact that he was and is the Messiah. Not to cure all the humans that he contacted or all those that were present on the earth at that time of their physical malady. Jesus sent his disciples into the world to make disciples, not to eliminate poverty and not to eliminate sickness and not to eliminate social disorder. He sent them out to seek and to save those that were lost. Jesus said in John 18, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21, Paul observes unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus through all, all ages, world without end. Amen. Make no mistake, the gospel requires benevolence. Do good unto all men. But the gospel's main emphasis should not be inverted and become to cure the social maladies of man. The gospel's purpose and the church's purpose is to preach and to teach the gospel of Christ to the saving of souls. Thirdly, the social gospel preaches sociology and the gospel of Christ preaches scripture and doctrine. Sermons of the social gospel quote and cite little scripture. Scripture quotations concerning such doctrines as salvation by the blood of Christ, the importance of the resurrection of Christ and the Great Commission are said to be second-rate, unworthy, and unimportant matters. The social gospel is majoring in minors and minoring in trivia. Go through the book of Acts sometime and notice the kinds of sermons preached under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the first century. The doctrine of the resurrection of Christ was dominant. The doctrine of the forgiveness of sins by the blood, blood of Christ was central in those sermons, and Scripture were used throughout as proof of these doctrines. Fourthly, the social gospel emphasizes the physical and the gospel of Christ emphasizes the spiritual. We can see manifestations of the social gospel all around us. Meals are used to entice Christians to attend. Sometimes I've been in places where the attendance for the meal after the Sunday morning service was greater than the attendance for Sunday morning worship. Those folks that came just for the meal were following Jesus for the loaves and the fishes. <laughs> There's an emphasis on the physical by the manifestation of such things as family life centers, nothing more than gymnasiums. Entertainment is provided by the church in many places. Plays and theatrical renditions of Bible characters and choirs and choruses and solos and other special groups are brought in to bring in people. There's a congregation in the Denver area a few years ago that put on a full-fledged production of Fiddler on the Roof. I wrote them up in Matters of the Faith and uh, got a call from the youth preacher in the congregation that had that production. And he justified it on the basis of evangelism. There were a lot of people who would come to the play incidentally about a Jewish uh, matchmaker, that they wouldn't get into the church building otherwise. Uh, that's not preaching the gospel of Christ, is it? We have uh, staff infections going on in many congregations of the Lord's church today, ministers of counseling, ministers of job training, ministers of involvement, and ministers of ministers. <laughs> 
under the idea of ministering to the whole man. Now, many of these things that I've mentioned uh, require a great deal of money and sometimes mortgages and bring on the fact that we become dependent upon the wealthy who are oftentimes not as strong in the faith as they ought to be and begin to compromise the truth to keep the money coming in. That's all part of the social gospel. The truth of the matter is that the gospel of Christ answers the needs of the whole man. Not the felt needs of man, but answer the needs of man. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 4, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. The scriptures are all sufficient for this result. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In Galatians chapter 1, again, Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Jesus the Christ did not come to change social customs, to change the form of government, to raise the cultural level of men, or to raise the standard of material prosperity. He came into the world to die in man's place. He came to save us from our sins. The changes brought about in the social, cultural, and economic character of people are indirect and secondary to Christianity's primary goal. Our responsibility is not to preach sociology, but salvation. Not to preach economics, but evangelism. Not to preach reform, but redemption. Not culture, but conversion. Not political progress, but pardon. Not a new social order, but the new birth. Not revitalization, but resurrection. Not a new organization, but a new creation through the new birth. Not democracy, but the gospel. Not civilization, but Christ and him crucified. Brethren, we as Paul should determine not to preach anything other than Christ and him crucified. Thank you. Another very excellent lesson. I know that we all appreciated that. And I think in hearing it, you realize just how many churches have really given over to some extent to the social gospel philosophy, theology, what are you going to call it? It's not right. And we need to get back then to emphasizing the truths of God, as we have said in the theme of this lectureship, in religion and morality. Those things began with God. Brother Lester has done us a great good in presenting this fine lesson. We want to stand adjourned for about 12 minutes, and then we'll come back in for our next session, which will be our regular evening worship hour. We'll stand adjourned.